there. This is the Scotch Way podcast, but then you probably already know that. In this podcast, we're going to talk theatre. The Edinburgh Fringe is almost upon us, and August is hoving into view. And it's often difficult to get solid recommendations as to what to see, and there's just so much on, as anyone who has looked at this year's programme will attest. The makers of Tyke, the play, um, got in touch, and in this podcast we talked to writer Rebecca Monks and the co-directors Madison Malin and Madeline Cunningham. Um, it's a fascinating project based on a true story, something I didn't know anything about, and I'll leave uh, Rebecca, Madison and Madeline to tell you more. The way that the podcast is structured, we'd be speaking to Rebecca first and then we have Madison and Madeline on the phone in the middle section and I hope the sound quality of that's not too bad. And then after that um, we're going to speak to Rebecca who also um, writes for The List magazine. We're going to talk a little bit about arts in Scotland in general and particularly the madness that is Edinburgh at fringe time. So we hope you enjoy it, and um, I'll see you after all of this. Cheers. Hello everyone, and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast. And today um, I'm going to be talking to Rebecca Monks. Hello, Rebecca. Hello. Writer, and specifically writer of Tyke, a play that's going to be coming to this year's Edinburgh Fringe. Um, tell us a little bit about the fascinating story by Tyke. Well, so Tyke is based on a true story. Uh, Tyke's the name of an elephant who performed in a circus um, all over the world, but uh, specifically in Honolulu in 1994, and she's become kind of a, a focal piece for animal rights activists because yep. in 1994 she rampaged, killed her trainer, and then went through the city, and eventually she was killed in a hail of gunfire, and it was just a tragic story. And um, so this play is based on that event, but it's fictional, uh, so none of the characters are based on any kind of real life people. Um, but it explores kind of the way that human beings interact with animals and also each other, and kind of imagines what kind of state we can get ourselves into for something like that to happen. Yeah. Um... It was a story I didn't know anything about, so when I knew I was going to be talking to you, I had a look at it. And obviously, heartbreaking. Um, what drew you to this story in particular? Well, I saw a documentary on it, and what I couldn't get around was the way that people had been kind of warning people about Tyke, that she had she had a temperament and that it wasn't the right thing to be uh, training her the way that she was being trained, uh, to have her perform the way she was performing. And I kind of looked at how this could have been avoided I think yeah. um, and that, that's what drew me is, is is what made this incident happen and like I say the actual storyline in the play is not based on that it's not based on the, the truth it's, it's, it's completely fictional so I just when I was uh, I studied creative writing and one of the things that they told me then was if you don't understand something try and write about it until you do and right. I, I, I've always taken that on board and so this is something I didn't understand I didn't understand why this incident happened in the first place and so I wanted to kind of write a fictional world which would imagine why it did. That's a really interesting idea. Um, so is the idea behind that that you'll look further into it, you'll research it or just you'll find some kind of understanding through creating the stories around it? Yeah, so it, it creates an understanding for yourself using your imagination to kind of think, okay, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't do this, for instance. Why would somebody else do it? And you have to put yourself into other people's mindsets and into different situations. And yeah, so in, in the play, uh, the plot's basically, there's a, a ringmaster whose circus is folding and he wants uh, he wants to draw in the crowds, he wants money, he wants to sustain his business. And so I was trying to think about, like, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be born from evil to want to kind of use animals in circuses. There are other motivations. And while I don't agree with it, it's putting myself in a headspace where I can write a character that would use animals to kind of entertain people and also to make some money. And so, yeah, writing in that respect really helps because it helps me to kind of understand why that might have happened for that reason. 
it's something that um, I mean I haven't been to the circus in a long, long time, yeah. and I had the feeling that it's in this country. Do you have animals in circuses anymore? Um, I am actually not completely sure about the legality of it. Yeah. I will say that Madison is our director, is a big animal rights activist, and she, when we spoke on the phone originally about her taking on the project, she was giving me a lot of hard facts. So she's definitely the one to ask. Okay, and we'll speak to her later on, so I'll yeah. get the hard facts. Um, but in th- this wasn't that long ago, the actual no. uh, occurrence, was it? No, it was 1994, so it's yeah. definitely within my living memory. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just something that it's quite shocking that it's not as famous as it is because it, there was a completely tragic accident of the death of the elephant, the death of the trainer. Uh, it, just a trauma that circus spectators endured. Like, imagine taking your family for a day at the circus and that's what you see. Uh, there's just, it's just tragic on so many levels and that, that's what kind of drew me to the story is that it's not a black and white, this is who was right, this is who was wrong, this is who I'm sad for, this is who I'm angry at. Yeah, sure. it, it's a complete spectrum and one of the things that we brought out in the play is there's three characters. Uh, there's Veronica who is very much pro-animal rights and there's Stefan who is in the middle and there's Proud Love who's this kind of ballsy ringmaster who just is only interested in his business and his self and profit and all three of them interact in a way that you can kind of see everyone's point of view and you can pick out good and bad in everyone's arguments although obviously I am on the side of Veronica I think that you know I think that animals in circuses is wrong but I, I, I made sure I wrote it in such a way that it wasn't just my opinion being leaked into a play I wanted to start a conversation about a dialogue and have people debate, you know, well, actually, he had a motivation for that, and, oh, I kind of understand where he was coming from. Yeah. I mean, it's different, just knowing the, the, the little bit about the story, that's a really difficult thing I would imagine to do as a writer, to try and make the other points of view at all sympathetic or understandable, yeah. because you immediately, so when you hear the story, and not just that the elephant was killed, but how it was killed, it wasn't just, yeah. as you might see in a television thing, where it's a dart and it falls asleep, I mean, this, this animal is butchered. Yeah. Um, but I know it was difficult for me to villainise the humanity in general because that's, that's what it would be I, I, sure. I could have wrote this black and white play where oh, aren't humans awful for putting animals yeah. in circuses but you know there's always reasons and people are stuck in financial situations that they have to get in um, and they, they do things you know, maybe to survive and also what I didn't want to do is disrespect the memory of those who had died in that incident you know yeah, I, I, I didn't want to villainise them at all like, and that's why I, I, I made sure that it was completely fictional and not based on anyone and kind of offered everyone a well-rounded character with points of view that you could relate to, even if you didn't agree with the outcome. Um, so you're putting it on uh, this year's Fringe. Now, did you mention it's going to be elsewhere beforehand? Or? Yeah, so it's going to the West End on 20th to 22nd of July at the Arts Theatre in Leicester Square. Uh, Fabulous. Yeah, we're getting three preview dates. We're really excited about it. And then it has a full run at the Edinburgh Fringe um, 6th until the 27th of August at Silk. Silk, which is a nightclub. It's a nightclub, yeah. We're going through PBH Free Friends, which is just a fantastic organisation for supporting yeah, absolutely. supporting artists that don't have any money. Like we do. Please give us some money. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of people getting tickets, is it just a case of first come, first served? Or you can yeah, so you turn up to the venue on your chosen night and... We always say it's free to get in, and then there's a bucket at the end. <laughs> Quite right, too. Yeah. Um, now, Edinburgh during the Fringe, obviously, there's a, a huge amount of competition. Is this quite daunting, or is it just exciting to put something on like this? I find it exciting. I mean, a lot of people have quite a negative attitude towards it, and that you're competing with other shows, but I don't, I don't really see it as competing. No. I see it as a chance to kind of put yourself on this plane where there's so many people creating exciting works, and you have the chance to put yours along. It and, and there's so many people with open minds that are coming to maybe see something new exactly. that they can't maybe see elsewhere. And it's such a great platform for for finding new talent. I mean, so many people break through on the fringe. I was I was writing a piece about Sarah Milliken and she she won a newcomer award. It was like 2008. Don't that might not be correct, yeah. but like then she just exploded. And so I mean, I'm not saying that we're going to be Sarah Milliken famous <laughs> <laughs> after this, but like it's just such a, a good way to to put yourself out there and your work. Um, 
Yeah, this isn't the first thing you put something on at the fridge, is it? No. Uh, so last year, it was my first place, Scour. Um, that was also another free friend show, and we put that on. It was just a one-man play. Uh, it was about HIV and the idea of people kind of secluding themselves when they feel like they they don't have any other options. So it's about Aiden. He put himself away on the Isle of Skye, and he cut out his friends and his family, and it was just a, a monologue really about that and it's about mental illness and physical health and it's quite challenging it's very different from Tyke <laughs> was it, I mean, was it a good experience I'm it was a fantastic experience yeah. so I, I, I took the play it with my own uh, production company Peacetime Productions and it was just me and my friend Josh who is the artistic director and the main actor in the company and we worked on that with our friend Daisy Jorgerson and the three of us uh, we learnt so much we learnt how to market a show we learnt how to cope with the stress of the fringe because it is stressful <laughs> like you need a cider at the end of every night I think <laughs> um, and yeah it really prepared us for Tyke in, in a big way um, actually so the, the way that Tyke is being brought up is quite an interesting story in itself yeah. so Peacetime was supposed to bring Tyke uh, and Josh was going to be the main character Okay. but he actually got booked for a tour in Austria and so I had a, the play there, I had the venue and I had no team behind it to cast it and so it was going to get cancelled uh, and I put out kind of like a Hail Mary pass where I emailed everyone I knew in the theatre industry and nice. I said please email everyone you know in the theatre industry and say this is a story, this is why I want to tell it, this is what I can offer and if anyone wants to take it on please do and about a week later Madison, our director so got in touch with me and she said it kind of feels like fate I've just set up a production company I campaigned against the use of animals in circuses I had a pet called Tyke wow <laughs> I know and she was like I, I just feel so strongly about this please can I read the script and I sent her the script and she said that she loved it and she we had a, a big meeting about the ideas that she had for it and it just sounds so fantastic and she's taken it on and she's pulled in a big team and and I just feel so grateful. It almost got cancelled, and she was just pulled it right in there at the last minute. Great. Yeah. Um, they're there. Uh, it's Black Sheep Productions, is that right? They're... Yeah, that's Madison's production company, and she works with James Lawrence, is the producer on this show. And Madeline Cunningham is co directing it with her because Madison is also starring in it as Veronica. So she did, she wanted to make sure that her performance was objective, I think. <laughs> Somebody else giving her notes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, we've just been uh, talking to Rebecca Monks, um, who has written Tyke, and on the phone now we've got Madison Malin and Madeline Cunningham, who are the co-directors. Um, hello to you both. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having us. No problem at all. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your own involvement in this project? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, as Rebecca mentioned, um, she put out a call to everyone in her network to try and get people involved and to kind of pick up Tyke. Um, and I heard about it through a friend, through a friend, and um, it just really spoke to me. I am a big animal rights advocate, and um, I'm vegan, and I campaign for <coughs> various different charities like um, ADI, which is um, Animal Defenders International, and PETA, and Greenpeace. Um, and so I, spoke, I got in touch with Rebecca and uh, we talked about the project and agreed that um, I would take it on as I'd recently just set up a production company um, which I'd co-founded with Maddie here and, um, and then I just went about kind of pulling people together so we had James, um, James Lawrence, our producer and then Maddie was uh, going to co-direct with me, and we brought on um, two amazing puppetry companies. All right. Yeah. Um, and uh, which are called Moon on a Stick and House of Stray Cats. So they're splitting the workload um, between them. So um, House of Stray Cats is building the puppet, and Moon on a Stick are um, directing it. And we've also got, um, they've got a whole team to kind of help um, bring Tyke to life and wow. work with the puppeteers. Um, so, it, and it's a massive, massive project that we, you know, we're kind of beg borrowing and stealing everyone's, uh, everyone's skills and 
and networks and connections and stuff to kind of get it off the ground. You know, just talking uh, to Rebecca earlier, I didn't even think about the practicalities of bringing an elephant to the stage, but that's uh, that must be pretty tough as it is. She's pretty big too. She's not a she's not a tiny marionette. No, <laughs> she's she's almost a slab size. She's she's massive. Yeah, she's massive. She's a two person job. Yeah, Tyke um, Tyke was an African elephant, which right. you might, might know is one of the biggest elephants that you can get. Um, so we had to, we decided to bring to life. Um, a modular puppet, so that means that she's not like a full puppet like you might see in War Horse or something. Okay. So she'll be like the head and the feet, and there'll be times throughout the performance where the actors will come together to bring um, to life an, an even bigger puppet. Um, so we're exploring stuff like that. Um, but as Maddie says, she's absolutely enormous. <laughs> um, and we're just so grateful to um, Maya, who, who runs um, House of Stray Cats, and she's just bringing to life the most stunning, stunning creation. I mean, it's almost amazing to believe that... that Something that from a beach ball and paper yeah. mache <laughs> and the canvas. Massively realistic infant head and body and yeah. beautiful. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Um, I mean, this sounds, you know, uh, it, obviously at the Fringe there's going to be so many shows, but it does sound like it might be difficult to avoid yours. I can see people saying, have you seen the Elephant Show yet? Exactly, that's what we're going for the whole time. No, joking. It, was, it, was, it, it is, it's, she's going to be a, a massively beautiful spectacle, but also dark reminder of what still is allowed to exist even now. Mm. Yeah. So we're hoping to, um, to yeah, use tight and raw miles. So uh, when you're walking up and down, keep your eyes peeled for her. <laughs> and uh, Madeline, what about yourself? Why why did you feel drawn to the project? Um, I've worked with my, um, Madeline before, and she I gave her my script, my baby, and um, she did beautiful things with it. So she directed uh, a piece I've written called Full Circle at the Art Theatre where we're doing the previews for Tyke, and it allowed me to access that, and it was just brilliant, and she said, here's this great script, and Edinburgh, and Animal Rights, and all three of those were a fantastic mix, and all of them really spoke deeply, and my whole thing is, theatre needs to be contemporary, it needs to be, yeah. and it needs to create a discussion, and this piece certainly that nothing will inspire that without being lecturing or anything. So I'm really, really thankful. And um, have you done, have you been involved in Edinburgh before in the Fringe or in the festival? Um, I, I've been involved um, in Edinburgh Fringe Festival before acting, um, but my God, that was almost 10 years ago. <laughs> um, and James, our producer, has been um, part of the Fringe before um, for a number of years. Um, and the play that he was in uh, won the Fringe First Award a couple of years ago um, called Travesti, so that did really, really well. Um, and Maddie has done lots on the South African Fringe circuit. Yeah, so we have our, our version of Edinburgh, which is a lot less cold. And <laughs> but it's pretty big, and it's, it's, it's almost... We, we have a lot of people from Edinburgh that come and want to do Fringe spots. And sure. Such a great vibe, and I've, it's always been something to aspire to. But to bring something to Edinburgh is something that I've always wanted to do. And um, we, I was going to do a fringe walk with my um, show wrote in South Africa, but I went to drama school instead. But now it's just like dream come true that I can actually work there and be a part of such a beautiful and interesting and exciting festival. And it sounds like quite a large production. Are you all going to be up during the festival while it's on? Yeah, we will. Um, I'll um, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm actually playing the part of Veronica. Yeah. Um, and so Maddie will be up as our director for the whole run, and um, James will come up for part of it. But yeah, no, we're quite a it's quite a big production. Like we've mentioned Tyke, so we're having to get her up to um, Edinburgh, and we've got two puppeteers and um, myself included, the two other actors as well. Um, so yeah, it is quite a big. Big thing, but we will all be up there, and obviously yeah. Rebecca is already up there. Yeah, oh, you mean you can't just stick Tyke on the train? Because that's not going to work, no, I don't. No, I don't think Tyke's um, going to be allowed on the train. <laughs> <laughs> we have to buy about three, 
yeah, no, she literally, I mean, I can't explain enough. She is literally the size of an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> um, she is huge. So, yeah, there's no, we can't even carry her on the tube over here in London. We're having to get, um, I'm having to borrow my dad's van to get her from rehearsal place to the next rehearsal place. So, um, so yeah, we can't be putting her on the train, unfortunately. <laughs> And you've got some previews in London, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we've got uh, previews in July, the 20th to the 22nd. Um, and yeah, we're just so excited. It's a fantastic space. As Maddie mentioned, um, we put on her play Full Circle uh, in December um, at the Arts Theatre, and it's just such a wonderful space. It's really intimate. The people that run it are just fantastic. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to put it on there and um, as part of our fundraiser, we're hoping to invite people um, to the previews if they donate at least like £30. So we're giving away kind of free tickets so people in London get to see it as well as people up in Edinburgh. Fantastic. And while we've got you on, is, is there any future projects that you'd like to mention or is it all take all consuming at the moment? At the moment, it's such a huge such a huge project that we're kind of so focused on that there are so many elements to bring together and um you know we're doing our fundraising campaigns and we're speaking to um charities because we're, like, we're giving 10 percent of all takings of our edinburgh run to an animal rights charity yeah um so we're kind of we're focusing on that at the moment we're focusing on any companies that are ethical that, that focus on animal welfare that might have community outreach sponsorship programs and so we're kind of on the lookout for that as well so um yeah there's a lot to do and that's kind of our focus at the moment but um but maddie and i do have a project in the pipeline which is yeah. very exciting yeah we've got a um sort of applying for a call for connect connecting south africa and the uk so it's sort of amalgamating work and i'm sort of writing a new new piece of work for that that we'll be involved in. Um, and then we've also got our Greek season that we hopefully going to continue with. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's a lot of fun getting Madison back writing, bullying her into that. <laughs> um, doing a cool little re revive a few pieces of brilliant ancient theatre. Yeah, ancient Greek theatre. So it's kind of uh, three, three different shows that we want to run in repertoire, basically. And... Um, also do workshops as well, you know, movement choral workshops alongside it to kind of supplement that and uh, that's a really exciting project. We yeah. just need to find paper to put it on now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> time to put it all together. <laughs> that's the hard part, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks to both of you for talking to us and I hope that um, everyone will come to see you when they're in Edinburgh and I hope that we'll be, we can catch up as well. talking to Rebecca Monks and I'm presuming Rebecca that Edinburgh in August is going to be a very busy time for you because you also write for The List. I do indeed, I'm an arts critic and the news editor for The List uh, so basically I'm going to sleep in September <laughs> is my motto I think. And now The List, did they do a weekly edition during the fringe? Yeah, right? so it's, there's a weekly Sorry free... Sorry to bring up the bad. <laughs> <laughs> free jokes on the early on until June. Yeah, there's, there's a weekly free edition uh, every week in the festival. Uh, it's got reviews, features, previews, the works. Yeah, it's a fantastic thing. We were talking about it earlier on, now seeing how The List uh, had been a bit of an inspiration for doing Scots Way in the first place and trying to get... There seemed to be less and less places where people could find out what was on their doorstep or what was coming up, unless there was big money behind it. Um, how, how difficult is it to think to keep a magazine like The List going in these times when nearly everything seems to be online and publishing in general is a difficult thing? Well, I mean, I can't really speak on behalf of the company, but just my experience is that The List has such a good reputation and it's just such a, a fantastic place to work and it's such a good resource that, you know, people know that they can turn to it if, if they want to find out what's on in a certain city on a certain date. Um, there's been a big move towards uh, the digital yeah. and we, we, ch we changed it up about a year ago where it's now a free edition instead of a paid for magazine and yeah. it's uh, every other month instead of every, every month. And, 
but yeah, I mean, it just keeps going because it's got good content, it's got good people behind it, and it's just a lovely place to work and a lovely thing to read, I think. It is, it's, it's remained, the quality of it still remains incredible, and as somebody who used to work in the restaurant business, the food guide is pretty oh, much yeah. a bit of a bible now, it's become such an yeah, institution. Yeah, I did my, I did my first year review for the food guide this year, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, is there anything that you would recommend yourself coming up with French? Oh, I interviewed the main actor, uh, Cal McCannick, in My Eyes Went Dark at the Traverse, and that sounds fantastic, uh, and also very dark, mm-hmm. indeed. But I think from the sounds of Scour and Tyke, you can probably imagine a, like, gritty theatre, <laughs> not, not clowning around. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't had a proper look through the programme yet. Yeah. Because um, I think we're going to pull in some ideas later on. But, yeah, there's, there's always some amazing stuff. And what I would recommend as well is uh, reading the early reviews and seeing what, what generates a little bit of buzz, because they tend to sell out. Yeah, that's right. So. I know last year I tried to see um, Our Ladies of Perpetual Sucker. Mm. And was, obviously that was a big, big production and everything, but... It immediately sold out like that. There's a few things like that actually, just smaller yeah. pieces that if it gets a bit of interest. Um, so we end up, I suppose, not look, concentrating on the French already because it shows how much other stuff's out there all year round now in Scotland. Yeah. As an arts critic, I mean, do you, do you agree with that? Oh, definitely. The arts scene in Scotland is just amazing. Mm. There's always something going on. Like, I mean, the Fringe is the world's biggest arts festival, but there's so many others like happening all year round that are just incredible. You know, um, if you look at even the Christmas and Hogmanay programmes, they're pulling in big, uh, big theatre acts, big music acts for audiences rather than just your, your typical kind of mulled wine stall like, yeah. that a lot of cities have. Um, and you know, you've got you've got great venues as well. You've got like the Traverse, the Sits the Lyceum putting on fantastic theatre productions and so many grassroots music venues popping up in every big city and you've got big cultural organisations like Noiriki and Rally and Broad doing spoken word. It's just, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I'm originally from just near Manchester and I've, I've lived here for almost nine years and there's something very special about the art scene in Scotland, like, especially Edinburgh, I think, Yeah. that you just, you just don't get elsewhere. I think what um, the festival does for Edinburgh is it's got some a bit of focus for the year and then that leaks through the rest of the year as well because yeah. people know it as a, as a city of the arts. Yeah. And I think, um, and I think maybe not, not so much now, I think that used to maybe overshadow the rest of Scotland, but I think you know, places like Dundee, for instance, we've got an incredible oh, yeah. art scene. And you've got the B&A coming in, and that's just going to yeah. explode. Okay. So I think actually that's going to blend out into a country, and actually as a country, people see it as a, as a place to come from the arts. And also the rise of the small festival. Yeah. Never, every, every week someone's getting in touch with <laughs> me saying that I've got this small festival happening. Yeah, well, we've, we've got our guide to Scotland's festivals, and it's just hundreds and hundreds. It's it's incredible. But I think that's one of the things that Scotland does so well, is put in the arts. Um, well, talking of the arts, what have you got future projects on the go, or can you not see past take at the moment? Um, as in my creative writing? Yes, and your creative writing. Yeah. I have something in the works that I want to talk about. can't talk about. <laughs> but I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, something I'm excited about, and the only reason I can't talk about it is it might not come off. Sure. And that, that's it. I don't want to jinx myself. Absolutely. And it's okay, I wouldn't even ask that question. <laughs> Um, well, Rebecca, thanks very much for talking to us. Oh, thank you for having me. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Tycho when it comes around. As I say, it's yep. a story I didn't know at all, and I think um, anyone will, will find out a bit more about it will want to come and see it. Yeah. Oh, well, I hope so. And well, we've got more information on Twitter um, at Tyke the Play. We'll be posting updates about ticket info and whatnot. And we'll put links to all of that on uh, the website as well. Oh, but for now, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back very soon with someone completely different. Cheers. Well, that was the pod that was. And I hope you agree. And that Tyke sounds like uh, an interesting project. And... I would suggest I I must not miss at this year's Fringe. If uh, you have any projects coming up or are involved in anything in Scottish culture that you think we might be interested in, please feel free to contact us 
um, via the Scots Way website and um, we could maybe be chatting with you. In the meantime, cheers. See you soon. <laughs>